Greetings students, Mr. Little here. And today we're gonna to take a look at landed empires under pressure. This would be corresponding to chapter 31 in your textbook. And so essentially we're gonna talk about the classically large land empires of Eurasia and how they responded to the increasingly powerful industrial powers of Europe. So if you think back to unit three, all those big empires that you talked about, the big landed empires. So by the end of this presentation, you should be able to answer the two following essential questions. How did the changes brought by the Industrial Revolution present political and military challenges to the land-based empires of Eurasia? And how did the land-based empires of Eurasia respond to and adapt to the changing economic and social situations generated by the Industrial Revolution. So with that said, let's get into it by talking about a little bit of broad overview. So we're talking about the historically large land empires, and this presentation is particularly going to focus on the Ottoman Empire, the Russian Empire, and the Qing Dynasty in China. Now these large land empires were quickly made aware of the growing strength of the industrial powers, military might, specifically the Crimean War and the Opium Wars. And as a result, these empires all sought to modernize or industrialize to some extent and in some way, shape or form. But this usually was limited to the building or buying of military technology or the reorganization of the army. And the intellectual and economic elites of these countries tended to focus on the idea of getting a constitution passed. And all three of these countries, the idea of a constitution or some sort of limit on the absolute power of the monarch was essential. Although as many of these groups would later find out that was not enough to affect real change. And in all three of these areas, it's interesting to note that some initial reform that seemed promising or, or might have promised results long term often was followed by a vast phase of very harsh repression. And so it, it's safe to say that in these three empires, reform as it stands was halting tentative and sometimes abortive. This picture right here I really like. This is meant to be the Ottoman Empire wedged between the two powers of Great Britain and uh, the, the Russian bear. It's kind of an analogy for where a lot of these large empires now suddenly found themselves with the changing economic and military situation of the 19th century. So let's start by talking about the Ottoman Empire. So one of the noticeable things about the Ottoman Empire going into the 1800s was that it was actually being dominated by its own military. You might remember the Janissaries from Unit 3 as that elite warrior class of recruited children who fought in the name of the Sultan. Well, over the years, a number of weak Sultans had given many concessions to the Janissaries, where by the 1800s, they were a self-perpetuating class that resisted any form of military improvement that would have threatened their personal positions. And to keep their privileged status, they murdered Sultans at will, they ran the government, and they would occasionally stir up revolts by being brutal to the subjects they had. One famous example was the Serbian Revolt of 1804, which was started by executing local Serbian leaders who the Janissaries thought were too loyal to the Sultan. In addition, their inability to stop the Napoleonic invasion of Egypt demonstrated their genuine weakness. And even though several Sultans tried to reform them, it wasn't until Mahmoud II who managed to suppress and murder all of the Janissaries did the Ottoman Empire finally have a modern functioning army. And during this time, the Ottoman Empire unlike most of these other empires, adopted free trade and willingly uh, agreed to trade with powers of Europe. It makes a lot of sense when you think about the history of the Ottoman Empire, right? As a nation that was founded and got most of its riches on trade, why would it have any need to have trade barriers? There were two major consequences of this opening up of trade with Europe. One was that Ottoman guilds, which had historically been very powerful and very productive, were absolutely annihilated by the importation of textiles from the United Kingdom. And the number of looms and weaver shops and guild shops declined drastically. At the same time, it became easier for the Ottoman merchants to simply sell raw materials like wool and copper to the United Kingdom and the other industrializing powers. And so in this way, the Ottoman Empire was sort of incorporated into the European core periphery model that we've talked about a little bit already. One word you hear a lot is the capitulations. This is a uh, designate special trade privileges that were given to foreigners. And this is usually seen as a bad thing, but the capitulations, at least initially when they were first formulated in the 1600s, were actually a way for the Ottoman Empire to get merchants to come into their empire. And so there was the, the capitulations, while initially were a positive thing, as soon as the Ottoman Empire began to lose military dominance, it rapidly became a very negative thing. And speaking of losing control, from the inside of the empire, there was rising nationalism. Um, one of the things about the Balkans, which you can see in this map up here, the Ottoman Empire ruled, is it was a very diverse area. 
And while for about 200 years, the, the people of the Balkans have been relatively calm, you know, minor uprisings here and there, none of those uprisings had ever had the force of the nation behind it. You have nationalism on the style of the French Revolution spreading into the Balkans, and you see a number of what we call national awakenings. You go to any Balkan country, Bulgaria, Serbia, uh, Greece, they'll talk about a national awakening, which is code for when they started rebelling against the Ottoman Empire. And essentially, it, these revolts may not have actually worked if it were not for the European powers intervening and uh, fighting against the Ottoman Empire, mostly Russia, but sometimes Britain and France too. And so as a result, the Ottoman Empire gradually began to lose its grip on its territories in the Balkans. They lost Greece, followed by Romania, followed by Serbia, uh, later to be followed by Bulgaria. This combined with external challenges from other European powers, such as Russia in the form of the Crimean War, which I mentioned, as well as the Ottoman province of Egypt, which even though it was technically still part of the Ottoman Empire, uh, waged a war on the Ottoman Empire and tried to conquer the Ottoman Empire. So a combination of nationalism within and external challenges from without put the Ottoman Empire in a very tough position by the mid 1800s. And so, like any empire in a tough position, there began a momentum for reform. And this reform takes the name of the Tanzimat, which just means reorganization, as well as a movement known as the Ottomanism movement. And that is a movement of uniting the empire around the image of the Sultan, sort of an Ottoman nationalism, if you will. What's interesting with the young Ottomans is most of them weren't even Turkish. The first meeting of the young Ottomans, Assyrian, Kurdish, Greek Muslim, as well as Arab. And what they sought to do was to create a new empire in which everyone was equal, but they were united under their loyalty to the Sultan, which meant Muslims and non-Muslims would pay the same tax. Everybody would serve in the new military. And this is a, a move away from the older millet system you might remember from earlier, where each religious group was allowed its own courts and its own law. Now everyone would be tried under the same court and the same law, kind of an equalization if you will, but this is going to um, backfire a little bit later. So this was coupled with a number of economic and political reforms. For example, the Ottoman Railway Company was set up in 1850. Although it was British run, the Ottoman Empire had trains like any other empire. Tax farming was abolished. The reform edict limited the power of the taxes the Sultan could levy. And a formal system of education was established in 1869. And all of this sort of culminated in the Ottoman Constitution of 1876, which was seen as a crowning achievement. And it included things such as Equal, equal representation for all, representative assembly, uh, and a Supreme Court. One of the thoughts of the reformers were that if Christians were equal to Muslims in the Ottoman Empire, this would remove the excuse that a number of European powers had had that the Ottoman Empire was abusing its Christian population. So while the constitution was in effect for about two years, the then reigning Sultan, Al-Hamid II, actually launched a counter coup in which he suspended the constitution and executed a number of the reformers who had implemented it. And from that point on until the end of his reign in 1909, he ruled absolutely and emphasized the Islamic nature of the Ottoman Empire. Specifically, he emphasized the caliphate. Technically, the Ottoman Sultan was also the caliph, which meant he was the leader of all of Islam. And so this loss of the first constitution and the continued loss of territory to nationalism, the seeming continued military defeats against Russia, spurred a group of army officers and other intellectuals to form a group called the Young Turks. Now, these are different from the Young Ottomans because the Young Turks are not about forming a new identity under the Sultan. They are about forming a pan-Turkish state, Turkey for the Turks. Um, and many of them lived in exile. They were exiled. They weren't living in the Ottoman Empire. They were living in Paris. They were living in Great Britain. And they had very enlightenment ideas. The idea of a Turkey for the Turks was not without merit at this time. For example, the loss of the territory in the Balkans as a result of that nationalism I talked about meant that increasingly what was left of the Ottoman Empire was mostly Muslim and mostly Turkish. And finally, uh, resentment against the Sultan and continuing military defeats led to the young Turks being able to launch a coup d'etat in 1909 and overthrow Sultan Al Hamid II. And from 1909 until the end of the empire, about 13 years later, the young Turks would rule the empire. There, it's really worth noting that the Ottoman Empire, in a lot of textbooks, is referred to as the sick man of Europe. But by the 1900s, the Ottoman Empire was smaller, but it was more compact. And thanks to the aid of Germany, who needed an ally in the Middle East, its army was being modernized, and the Ottoman Empire would play a major part in World War I. So it's worth keeping in mind the sick man of Europe, maybe, but maybe that's a bit of an overstate. Let's move on. Let's talk about another great landed empire just to the north, the Russian Empire. Now, the Russian Empire started the 1800s in a very strong position, having been one of the key elements in the defeat of Napoleon Bonaparte. They came out of the Napoleonic Wars looking really strong. 
That said, the Napoleonic Wars had their own effect on Russia. So, for example, in 1825, a number of officers who'd actually been stationed in Paris during the occupation after Napoleon's defeat attempted to launch a coup against the new Tsar and demand a more reformist Tsar. This is known as the Decemberist Revolt. And while it was put down, it really got the Tsars nervous about the idea of reform and what it might mean. So the Tsars emphasized a sort of pan-Slavism, that is a kind of Slavic nationalism, and this was directly targeted at the Ottoman Empire because almost all of the Slavic people at that time, they were not already ruled by Russia, were ruled by the Ottoman Empire. Combine this with a number of wars of expansion that kept the energy of the nation for a while uh, in Central Asia and the Caucasus, and the Russian Empire through the first half of the 19th century was looking pretty good. Then came the Crimean War, and the total defeat of the Russians in the Crimean War in the face of Britain and France demonstrated to the Russians their need to industrialize. Alexander II launched an ambitious reform program. One of the first things he did was to formally abolish the system of serfdom, which had been part of Russia for almost 400 years. Now, the serfs were officially freed from their land. They no longer held labor obligations to the local aristocrats. However, they were not given any opportunities to do anything with their freedom. And as a result, many went back to just working for their former masters, or they moved to the growing cities. This is very similar to reconstruction in the United States. You free this formerly bounded labor force, but you don't give them anything to do or work with. Therefore, their political freedom seems a bit hollow, lacking economic opportunity. So then we have industrialization. Russia actually industrialized relatively quickly compared to the rest of Europe, although they were dependent on European expertise uh, for much of that time. The abolition of serfdom did give Russia a large labor force. However, the long history of serfdom meant that most Russian peasants were even less skilled than their British or French counterparts. There was an ambitious finance minister named Sergei Witt who launched a system that invited foreign investment and resulted in the creation of the Trans-Siberian Railway, which connected the western half of Russia, the part by Moscow and St. Petersburg, all the way with the eastern part over by China, as well as promoting uh, oil exploration in the Caucasus. By the end of the century, by the 1900s, Russia's economy was only about 15% industrial. It was an incomplete industrialization, if you will. And while the military was stronger, at least it seemed, uh, there was about there was a big test on the horizon for the military. While the Tsar Alexander II sought his uh, political reforms, uh, the economic reforms didn't really follow said political reforms. And so there were a number of groups of radicals who genuinely thought that the pace of change was not proceeding fast enough. For example, there was, after the abolition of serfdom, there were small councils set up called Zimstvos, um, which were for the free serfs. Uh, to organize their communities. However, these councils were still dominated by the aristocrats who used to have title to the serfs. And so to many serfs, this didn't look like any change at all. This just looked like more of the same. And as a result this, of this discontent, both with the serfs and with the intellectuals in the city, living under an absolutist monarchy, a number of groups of anarchists and socialists began to form and take action. And in particular, one very extreme group called the People's Will assassinated Alexander II in 1881, blowing up his carriage with a bomb. Turns out he had a bomb-proof carriage. He steps out of the carriage, they throw another bomb at him, which blows him up. And so there goes the czar. Another group of uh, radical socialists uh, attempt to form a labor party in 1898. And upon their first meeting, every single member is arrested and thrown in prison. So these th there was discontent under the surface, even though it seemed initially like economic reforms might be leading to an improved situation. Alexander II is succeeded by Alexander III, who rules with an iron fist and the motto orthodoxy, autocracy, and nationality. And as part of this system, in an attempt to unite Russians behind him, Russia witnessed a series of pogroms against Jewish Russians. Large Jewish communities in Russia were targeted for violence, either directed by the local police or at least with the acquiescence of the local police. And this is part of the reason so many Jewish individuals migrated to the United States during this time or to South America during this time was to escape these pogroms, this directed violence against them. Uh, if you've ever seen the story Fiddler on the Roof, it's, it's the story of a Jewish family in Russia dealing with the changes during this time. There's a depiction of a pogrom uh, in that particular story. Now, while the economic reforms seem to at least be somewhat industrializing Russia, you, you saw some factories popping up in some of the major cities like Moscow and St. Petersburg, the big challenge to Russia came in 1905 when their expansion into Siberia led them right up to the border with China uh, as well as... So one of the things you have to understand before we go any further is that Russia's strategic objectives during this time had always been to get a warm water port. What you have to understand is that even though Russia is large, it's landlocked. And so it's always looking for easy access to the sea. During their expansion east, 
uh, they pressured the Chinese to give them a port on the Liaodong Peninsula, that is a, a cross from Tsingdao, uh, and they had set up this naval base there. Now, this was part of their plan uh, to get more ports. However, it made the Japanese very uneasy. Japan, who had recently managed to begin its own industrialization process and build up its influence in Korea and the northern part of China, saw this as a challenge, and as a result, to challenge Russia for dominance and declared war on them in the Russo-Japanese War, which was mostly fought on land, but saw two incredibly decisive battles at sea. One at the Battle of Tsushima, where the entire Russian Baltic fleet, which had had to sail all the way from the European side of Russia around the coast of Africa to Japan, only to get defeated. And the defeat by the Japanese so angered the Russian people that they went on strike against the government. Uh, women, workers, socialists, anarchists, people of all levels of society rioted all across Russia. This is referred to as the Revolution of 1905. In the end, the Tsar agreed to set up a kind of parliament called the Duma, which was a limit on his power. But this wasn't really effective, and the Tsar continued effectively to rule as a, an unlimited autocrat. So by the end of the 19th century, Russia found itself in a really bad position, although it had managed to modernize its economy somewhat and industrialize somewhat, building railroads such as the Trans-Siberian Railroad, it faced severe unrest at home in the form of extremist groups, and it faced defeat overseas from the Crimean War all the way over to the Russo-Japanese War. Although it did, I should say, it, it had some victories against the Ottomans in between. Uh, nonetheless, militarily, it was viewed as not the strongest power of the Europeans. Let us continue by talking about the Qing Dynasty. In the year 1800, the Qing Dynasty was looking pretty good. It was the largest economy in the world, had the largest population in the world, it was internationally respected, and it had complete control of its borders. You might remember the Canton system, whereby Europeans were not allowed to trade except in certain places and certain times. However, there were signs that things may not all have all been good. For example, uh, there were a number of small anti-Manchu uprisings, most notably the White Lotus Uprising. And there were signs of ecological stress, some uh, an increase in poor harvests, an increase in deforestation. Uh, there were some signs that instability might be on the horizon. Uh, perhaps the rude awakening, though, came with the first Opium War. So you might remember that China was the world silver sink, right? All that silver from the Americas just flowed into China. British were not above this. If they wanted anything from China, like tea, they were going to have to pay in silver. And they didn't like this. And so a number of British merchants started doing was paying with opium. This is the drug. And by 1820, they had completely reversed the flow of silver. Now the Chinese were paying them silver for this drug, resulting in a number of addicts. Opium can be an incredibly addictive substance. Uh, the United States has found this out with our ongoing opioid epidemic. And one very particularly, I guess, righteous would be the word to call it, Lin Zexu, who was an administrator in southern China, famously uh, confiscated and destroyed some somewhere in the realm of like $3 million worth of opium, and sent a letter to Queen Victoria saying, you can't, you shouldn't trade opium here, it's wrong. In fact, this is a Chinese description of him overseeing the destruction of the opium. However, the British were not going to take this lying down. Those British merchants appealed to their parliament, and parliament sent naval ships to bombard the coast and sail up river and bombard cities all along the Yangtze River. And the inability of the Chinese to stop this fleet resulted in what is known as the unequal treaties. It's treaties that were imposed upon China, China did not negotiate those treaties. So for example, in the treaty that ended the first opium war, the British got the island of Hong Kong as a colony. They got extraterritoriality for their merchants, which meant that they were exempt from Chinese law, and they got a large indemnity in silver. That's a, a large payment for the war in silver. It is worth noting that Hong Kong would be the base where some of those big financial institutions we talked about from Chapter 29 were founded, and they were founded specifically to help further the trade of opium, which was also allowed under the Unequal Treaty. And all of this was done under the name of free trade. One of the things the British had said during the war was that that you know, the Chinese weren't civilized because they didn't embrace free trade like we did. So we have to go open them up to free trade using our gunboats. This was followed up by a second opium war when China refused to give concessions to the French, which famously resulted in the destruction of the Summer Palace in 1860, which was a massive humiliation for the Chinese that had not been seen since the time of the Mongol conquests. Now, while all of this was brewing on the coast, inland, there were other troubles afoot. A school teacher and failed civil service exam named Hong Tioquan had a messianic vision of of himself as the leader of a Chinese Christian kingdom. He believed he was a brother of Jesus of Nazareth, and it was his job to create 
a great heavenly kingdom and drive the Manchus out of China. And even though not everybody exactly believed in this grand vision of his, many people followed him who were upset with the status quo. So for example, many people who didn't like Manchus ruling uh, Han, uh, women who wanted gender equality because there was gender equality in his typing heavenly kingdom. Uh, he also redistributed land to peasants who had seen it gradually being accumulated in the hands of great landowners. Also, he was a member of the Hakka people, a hill people in southwestern China who had seen their way of life being damaged by increasing settlement by Han Chinese. And so all of these factors came together and made the Taiping Rebellion one of the most destructive and devastating rebellions in Chinese history. It lasted 14 years. It may have killed 100 million people. The numbers are incalculable. But what's really interesting, that some historians have speculated, that it's very possible the Taiping Rebellion might have just been the dynastic cycle at play. Is it possible that the Taiping Rebellion could have toppled the Beijing government if the European powers had not intervened to save the Beijing government, which they did. So is it possible this was just the dynastic cycle at play? Had the government in Beijing lost the mandate of heaven? Chinese history, imperial history, goes in cycles. And maybe the Qing dynasty, after about 150 years, was at the end of their cycle? I don't know. It's an interesting question to ask. So the combined devastation of the Taiping Revolt and the Second Opium War and the Summer Palace burning led to a movement known as self-strengthening. That was where the Chinese believed they had to build up their weapons production, uh, although some Chinese generals did build weapons factories, such as General Li Hongzhang, who built the famous Nanjing arsenal that built some of the first modern military equipment in China that could match the Europeans. There was no fundamental effort at industrialization. Almost all industrial efforts during this time were specifically directed at the production of weapons or ships. This included like shipyards and other arsenals. And there was actually some success. It wasn't all a downhill spiral. For example, France attempted to extract more concessions out of southern China by invading through Vietnam, and the Chinese managed to fight them off. Uh, and force them into a stalemate treaty in 1884. And in 1881, Russia attempted to negotiate more extraterritoriality rights from China, which they bluffed their way out of. So China did manage to hold its own. Self-strengthening was strictly an endeavor to simply learn as much as could be learned about uh, the Europeans, but no effort to fundamentally change. And then came the Sino-Japanese War. So Japan, after its industrialization, which we're going to talk about later, had been increasing its influence in Korea. And what had happened was the Korean king faced a peasant revolt, and he asked the Chinese emperor for help, please help me put down this peasant revolt, to which the Japanese saw as a challenge to their influence. And so when the Chinese military moved into Korea, the Japanese military moved into Korea, and the Japanese fleet moved into Chinese waters. And this, this war was a total defeat for the Chinese. The destruction of almost their entire fleet and all the progress that had been made with the self-strengthening movement was completely wiped out. Not only that, but this was a massive humiliation. Remember that China had been the center of East Asia for centuries. Now, not only had they lost influence in one of their tributaries, Korea, they'd also been defeated by a former tributary, Japan, the country that had in historical times been known by the Chinese as the dwarf country. So this was a massive, massive awakening and a massive blow and led to something called the 100 Days of Reform, which was a radical overhaul, an attempt to radically change everything. As you can imagine, it probably didn't go very far because, you know, Radical change tends to take time and can't be done in 100 days, but it included things like uh, a proposed constitution, a system of modern education. But this was ended by the very conservative Dowager Empress that meant she was ruling for her son, the Dowager Empress Qi, who not only shut down the 100 days reform, but executed a number of the reformers themselves uh, and then proceeded to rule absolutely until the end of her reign uh, in 1908. And while the government of China may not have been able to do much to stem the flow of Europeans moving into China, both for business as well as missionary movement, um, a number of groups began to coalesce around the idea that they needed to drive out the barbarians. So specifically one group known as the Society of Righteous Harmonists Fists, but known by the Europeans as the Boxers, and hence the name Boxer Rebellion, combined Chinese martial arts and anti-Christian sentiment uh, and a sense of millenarianism similar to other religiously inspired revolts against Europeans, such as the cattle movement or the ghost dance. And they began to openly attack European missionaries in the country and then attacked European settlements in large Chinese cities. Now, this was actually supported by Empress Qi, even though a lot of her advisors said it would not be a good idea to support this movement. Uh, and this led to something called the Eight Nation Alliance, which was all of the major European powers, plus the United States, plus Japan, 
invading China and crushing the boxers. It is worth noting that the boxers actually did receive um, some moral support from a number of Western intellectuals such as Mark Twain in the United States and Leo Tolstoy in the Russian Empire. But the result of all of this was the thought that maybe the European powers should just carve China up for good. However, the United States was concerned about losing a market in China, which it had just fought a war in the Philippines for. And so the United States insisted in 1900 and forced the European powers to come to an agreement on something called the open door policy. And therefore China would remain independent, but it would remain part of the informal empires. That meant that it was not controlled in whole by any European empire, but would remain part of the informal empires during this time. Of the three nations we've talked about here, Russia, uh, the Ottoman Empire and China. China probably suffered the most during this time period. So, I mean, the Ottoman Empire may have been defeated multiple times, but their, their capital was never uh, occupied as the Chinese capital was after the Boxer Rebellion, nor were their palaces burned to the ground as the Summer Palace was during the Opium Wars, which is referred to as the century of humiliation for a good reason. I'll sort of wrap this up by talking about some other landed empires that also found themselves under pressure. So the Khajur dynasty, which ruled Persia, had succeeded the Safavids, you might remember from Unit 3. And they were under pressure from the Russian Empire, who was continually attacking and, and depriving them of territory in the Caucasus. And in an effort to modernize their army and, and pay for the expensive cost of a modern army, they began to sell concessions. This was kind of like the capitulations in the Ottoman Empire. They sold concessions to European businessmen. And in particular, one very interesting episode was called the Tobacco Concession. The ruler, the Shah, gave the right to sell and control the tobacco trade of the entire country to one English businessman. And this led to massive public outrage, just unbelievable public outrage. Huge protests in the street. Everybody came together, merchants, religious leaders, the urban, the rural, the workers, everybody protested. And it really just showed the real weakness of this supposed king of kings, the Shah was the king of kings allegedly, in the face of increasing European economic imperialism, bringing uh, Persia into the informal empire of Russia and Great Britain. Then there's also the situation in South Asia. Now, we've talked about how the British were beginning to assert their authority in Bengal. We'll talk about that a little bit uh, in, in the next chapter, but even without the British in Bengal, the Mughal Empire was under pressure from a rival empire, which had established itself in southern central India called the Maratha Empire. Now, the Maratha the Empire were a group of Marathi-speaking warriors from one very particular clan, and they rebelled against the Mughals for a number of reasons, but one of the reasons was this idea that the Mughal Empire and the land around it should be a Hindu nation, uh, something called the idea that South Asia should be a Hindu state, an idea that's still very popular with some leaders in India today. And they actually had great military success against the Mughals. They actually conquered a lot of Mughal territory in the course of their campaigns, but they found it very difficult to hold this territory. And even though they had this great naval admiral, Kanhoji Angra, I believe that's how you pronounce his name, but he, he was a brilliant naval tactician. He built a navy very quickly and managed to defeat, defeat several European powers in open naval combat, including the British and the Dutch. They were not able able to consolidate their empire or resist the British going forward. The Mughal Empire itself was not doing much better. One of the last powerful emperors of the Mughal Empire, Aurangzeb, died in 1707. And after his death, almost the entire empire rose in revolt against uh, his harsh policies of taxation and his excessive military expenditures. And by the 1750s, the Mughal leadership had shrunk to literally just Delhi. And then after 1750, uh, would be essentially a British puppet until 1857 when the empire was officially ended. So this has been a brief look at landed empires facing pressure during this time. You should be able to answer those two questions from the beginning. My name is Mr. Little, and I'll see you next time. Hey there. Thanks so much for watching. I hope this video was able to help you. If you appreciate this kind of work, please like and subscribe. And of course, I welcome any kind of feedback or suggestions, so feel free to leave a comment down below. Thanks so much for joining me. I'm Mr. Little, and I'll see you next time.